Tuesday, July 9th. Roll call, please. And just as a reminder to all who are in attendance, this meeting is being recorded and live streamed on the county's YouTube page. Calling the roll, Mr. Gallagher? Here. Ms. Conwell? Mr. Byrne is absent. Mr. Kelly? Here. Ms. Simon? Ms. Simon is absent at the moment. There is a quorum. Also, like the record to reflect that Councilman Miller is in attendance. Welcome, Mr. Miller. Uh, public comment? Uh, no, Mr. Chair. No one is signed in. In your packets, we have the minutes of June 25th. If they're in order, I'll accept the motion in a second. So moved. Second. Motion a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Thank you. 2024-0265. Resolution number 2024-0265, authorizing an amendment with alcohol monitoring systems for GPS alcohol bracelets and monitoring services. Good afternoon, Councilman Gallagher and Council Members. Chris Costin, Sheriff's Department. Before you is a request to amend the contract that we currently have with alcohol monitoring systems. This amendment is to add $2,400,000 and to extend the term to December 31st, 2026. This contract is for GPS, alcohol bracelets, and monitoring services. We are currently paying $3.33 a day a day per unit uh, that includes the bracelet itself as well as the monitoring fee the current contract ends 12 31 2024 and the rates will not change with this amendment thank you Chris, what, what are the rates uh, the bracelet rental itself is 95 cents a day and the monitoring is two dollars and 38 cents a day per unit and uh, we don't get any help from anybody on that not in the sheriff's department. Uh, we do have the contract split with juvenile as well as common pleas. I don't know if they get any help, but we do have members from their divisions as well. And the people that are being put on the bracelets, do they pay anything, do you know? I couldn't answer that. I could bring them up here and ask them. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Tammy Sherman. I'm with Cuyahoga County Adult Probation Department. I'm the chief probation officer. Um, our clients, if they are sentenced to probation, they are charged $3.20 per day, but they also have the opportunity to perform community service to satisfy those fees. We've recently, recently increased the rate of community service from state minimum wage to $15 an hour. So they're given an opportunity to perform community service or pay the $3.20 per day. But the overall fee, so sometimes we have people on for a period of time, it's not to exceed $520. Um, our pretrial clients are not required to make payments pending the disposition of their case. Okay, but the, the, the total tallies as it goes along, and if they're found guilty, then they have a cost, correct? Correct. And where, who gets that money? The um, For GPS fees, mm -hmm. those fees, the monies we collected, they're um, passed over to the Sheriff's Department. Alcohol monitoring fees uh, remains with the Probation Department, and those fees are generally used to keep the equipment running um, and things like that. Okay. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, Council. Um, Mary Bridget Smith, uh, Juvenile Court Home Detention Manager. Juvenile Court uh, clients do not pay anything to have their bracelet on. However, if the bracelet is determined to be broken, damaged, or destroyed, the parent or guardian is responsible for a financial responsibility piece that they do pay, and our financial or our finance department takes care of that. Okay. Thank you. Questions? Thank you. Further? Thank you. All right. Well, that was just a concern I had, so that takes care of that. Yes, Mr. Miller. So, have are there other options where we could actually own the bracelets? And and have have we looked into this and found that rental is better? And uh, do we get charged for bracelets that are, are broken, lost, or, or damaged? And, and if so, how much? Uh, I'll have to get back to you with that as well. I, I do not know that information. 
and uh, how many how many bracelets do we currently have in service? Um, as of let's see, in June we had seventeen thousand eight hundred just in the sheriff's department. Uh, eighteen thousand in May, April we had eighteen thousand. March we had about nineteen thousand units that we paid for. That's a lot of bracelets. I, I'm surprised by that number. Donna Cleal, Sheriff's Finance Manager. Though on any given day, we average anywhere from 600 to 650 that are on a bracelet. So that 18,000 number, that's kind of like the number of bracelets times the number of days, something like that's that. That's the number of days, uh -huh. not the number of bracelets. Okay. That sounds more like it. And... and uh, is the number sufficient to uh, to cover the need for 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 all the available uses, or or could we use more? That I can't answer. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Good, after, good afternoon again. Um, the amount that's being requested, yes, it's enough to cover. We, Like um, Donna Khalil said, we normally operate off of, on a daily average, 600 to 625 bracelets. But with the increase of more bracelets call, um, comes with the increase of um, more probation officers and sheriff's deputies to perform the duties of, you know, installing, monitoring, putting in schedules, the rest of the work that become that comes with it. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. And that 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 leads to concerns down the road is when you have that kind of a number on the bracelets and following these folks 24 hours a day and having the necessary backup to go get them if they cut it off or they violate anything. So how are we doing in that area, do you know? Um, I, I don't know. I do know that, um, <clears throat> yes, from the time we went to from passive to active, now when we get an alert, we have to respond immediately. So um, how we're doing um, and the response time, I guess, again, that would be a law enforcement question. Uh, if we... The yep. sheriff or Mr. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Car Mr. Carbone. You may as well just stay up here. <laughs> um, so without going into too much detail um, regarding our policies and procedures behind responding, the sheriff's department does have a response plan in place when somebody goes into a victim zone or when a bracelet is um, removed, cut. Um, but because we're on, in public, we don't want to go into detail of what that time is. But you coordinate with the sheriff's department to make sure that that they have the necessary uh, people available for the amount of bracelets that's, that are being put out there. Yes. Yeah, so the sheriff's department monitors the actual movement for adult probation, um, 24 hours, seven days, and they respond to those type of alerts when they receive them. They, they have their own GPS unit full of deputies that's just responsible for monitoring. Right. I just don't want to, I, I'm just wondering what, what, what is the point of saturation for, uh, for, the, for the sheriff? Or are we beyond that point? Um, uh, Councilman, just to bring up, the electronic monitoring unit is, is the one that monitors that. They have a uh, uh, total plan for response to absconsions and cuts and other various things that they go through. Uh, again, this is a public forum, so I'm not going to get into those details, mm -hmm. but they do have that, and that point of saturation, sir, uh, is probably an executive session discussion uh, on numbers of not only um, deputies assigned, but also amount of people in the program. Okay, well, we'll save that. Yes, sir. Okay, anything, anything further? Thank you very much. I won't call you back up. <laughs> You're welcome. If everybody's comfortable with 2024-0265, and looking at the dates, I would imagine. Make a motion. Do we, you don't, do we need three? You, you could go three. We can go three readings. We yes. can go three readings. Okay, I'll, I'll accept a motion. Second. Uh, to the full council for second reading. 
motion and a second. <laughs> Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Thank you. Thank you. And we have a, a quick update from the sheriff. And Ms. Simons in attendance. Good afternoon, Council. Uh, certainly. Uh, oh, there we go. Excellent. And the clicker. Is that up here? Only a few of mine, so we'll be good. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, Council. Uh, thank you for uh, having me here today. Just a brief update on a few things that we're going to touch on. Uh, within the um, sheriff's department, not only in the correctional facility, but also uh, in law enforcement operations. Uh, one of the bullets on this, uh, this meeting was uh, overtime, and uh, we're at about the mid-year point here, so it's important that we go over this and kind of see where we stand and it provide you an update. As you have the numbers there in front of you. Uh, I'm not, not going to go through all of them, but it's important to know uh, where we stand. There's a slight elevation uh, on a couple of them from uh, last year. I think that that is primarily attributed to the collective bargaining agreements. We also just uh, went to Fact Finder and completed the um, uh, CBA with the Deputy Sheriff's Union. So that's an, another one that also uh, completed, but it also had a, a adds to the uh, to the budget to the bottom line there. I have listed there by division also, and at the very bottom, uh, just a quick blurb on the current cost uh, year to date of the uh, DSP, and that's another uh, uh, topic. I probably should have had a whole slide on that. Uh, terrific work done by them, but as we discussed, it's something we're gonna transition and we're going to rescope uh, their deployment. Uh, we're even going as far as to um, uh, change the name, and that is something I'd like to just report to council. Uh, I met with the uh, unit and talked with them in depth, and I'd like, like for them to have a little bit of uh, uh, contribution to, to the naming rights. In the past, we talked about impact unit and that, and they've come up with a few, and it's not soup yet, but I'd like for you to hear it first. Uh, Special Operation Group, SOG, Cuyahoga Regional Impact Mobile Enforcement, acronym is CRIME, Criminal Addiction Unit, Criminal Suppression Unit, Force Response Unit, uh, Force, or uh, Director Safety Patrol, or we can go back to the old M Community Relations Impact Unit, or Community Impact Unit. So we have some variations, we're gonna change that. Uh, and that's uh, gonna be hand in hand with a discussion with the Cuyahoga County Police Chief Association. Uh, they're calling as it is. We've been to various cities uh, th throughout the um, uh, county for various services. So the name downtown tying it there has not precluded those chiefs and mayors from calling. So we'll continue doing that, but that is a whole uh, project. Uh, we're gonna have a policy on it. I've uh, discussed it with the executive's office as far as uh, refocusing and changing the name because that's that's important that all of our municipalities get a chance to call them and, and receive the service. I know we keep referring back to the previous impact unit and that concept uh, worked really well deploying throughout the, the region but there was the policy on it. Right now it's been a practice but it will be a policy. We're going to re redo that. So I just want to bring you uh, up to speed on that and that's their current cost. Um, their great work entails uh, about 98 weapons seized this year only in 2023, uh, 24, I'm sorry. And four, um, uh, not to mention a uh, number of felony arrests, uh, uh, drug seized, and also uh, obviously um, a cash seizure of $41,000 year to date, 35 felony arrests, uh, a lot of um, warrant 100 warrant arrests also. So that work is terrific, and we're going to continue to do that work in other spaces and I think that our local police chiefs and mayors will be very welcoming to that also as, as they have been already. So enough about that. Now, next slide, please. Historical overtime by year. I, th I would suspect the 21 COVID had an impact on that, uh, on that being significantly lower. And then also in 22, uh, it went up $5 million and was fairly consistent throughout 23. So uh, important to note also, we put on here the hours those are staffing hours, and uh, just uh, members of my staff, we've had this discussion. We use the term staffing hours, not man hours. I think it's appropriate to use the term staffing hours. But uh, we look at the numbers here, where we are, and obviously uh, the staff does drive the, uh, the budget. And as the CBAs come through and the, the salaries go up, well, that's going to be impacted. But it's good to know where we have been uh, the last few years there also. Next slide. 
Geo medical transports, we've had a lot of discussion on this, and it is a, a core component of what we must do because it's important that when someone has a medical need in the correction facility, we get them uh, the best wor the world-class pre-hospital care that we can deliver, and that's something we're doing good on. Uh, however, it comes at uh, a taxing on the system, not just monetarily, uh, time, deployment, et cetera. And, and the other thing that comes with that is, is risk. And that's something that we all need to uh, understand. And we know from all of our models we've talked about before, uh, we can buy down risk, but risk can never be eliminated. So we buy down the risk as best we can because that is a component. When someone's having a medical emergency, they need some service. So here we uh, go uh, January through May. You see what the uh, cost is and the amount of transports. And it's important to note that these transports, uh, and we'll get in the next slide, we'll talk about different categories. But the reasons vary. Obviously, the most concerning and uh, critical need for transport is chest pains because you never know what could be going on. Someone's having chest pains, clearly understandable. And it goes down from there. Uh, we've had a series of, um, uh, of reasons, some in tail x-rays, maybe some internal pain, et cetera. But uh, the, the point is someone in a facility requires service, and it's either going to be acutely critical, where, as an example, chest pains, where the ambulance will convey um, the prisoner along with uh, uh, staff to the hospital, or we have some injuries that require, or some uh, illness that requires transport by uh, uh, sheriff's car. So just want you to uh, be aware of that. But those collectively, here are the numbers, and we'll, uh, on the next slide we'll talk a little more about uh, categories. Uh, next slide, please. Again, we're going through May, and this gives you a good breakdown on uh, ambulance transports, transported by deputies in a, in a car, and the hospital details. Hospital details mean somebody was seen at the hospital and medically they had to remain at Metro Hospital. So since they're remaining there, uh, we're, we're responsible for the custody, care, and control. So that's a function that we're providing. And that, and you see the numbers there, but it's important that we uh, make sure that the individual is safe and also that the individual remains in custody because that's what the, you know, our judicial system wants. So that's, uh, that uh, column that says hospital details, that's what it is. That number, um, obviously there's some, some fluctuation there, but you can see how it's more elevated because those details are constant. Sometimes there are three days, four days, six days, and those are 24 hours a day. Whereas a hospital run could be a four or six hour job, depending on what, what the situation might be, a detail obviously, by definition, um, the individual is going to be there for a bit. So we do the best that we can. Our uh, staff in the correctional center works with the judges and the clerk to get individuals released wherever we can so that they can go ahead and take care of their medical uh, issues without the uh, additional um, uh, matters of being in, in custody. But everyone can't be, can't be released. Everyone can't be bonded out despite the, their medical uh, crisis. So those we have to remain there, and that's where the uh, detail comes from. So those are your numbers. At the very bottom, I just want to bring your attention to, to the, the bottom uh, uh, row uh, where it speaks to the grand total on trips. And you can add, the, you see those are 600. 600 through the end of May, not including June. 600 times that we deployed. Oh, Sheriff, through the chairman, yes, if sir. I may. The, these... Uh, hospital details when you get there and you try to get a furlough through the uh, courts. Do you have a number of the furloughs that don't return the, as they're supposed to? I mean, is there a percentage? Through the chair, through the councilman. I'm sure there is, sir. We will drill down into that. That's actually a good, good question. Number one, how many of those are granted? And number two, how many return? Right. Because it was occasioned by their, by their medical crisis. So that's a good one, sir. We will add that to our uh, data here. Thank Appreciate you. it. Thank you. Good point. Thank you. So uh, that 600 times that somehow or another a person had experienced a medical emergency and had to be conveyed to the hospital for treatment. Some came right back a few hours later, some many hours later, and then some became hospital details, which means they were overnighters for a couple of days, and, and there's the uh, associated cost. I, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. the chair. So these numbers of runs, do, how does this compare relative to the population in the jail? The jail's been consistently um, maintaining a population. In the does 15. this matter? Around what? What are we at? Around 1,500. 15. It might be 1,496, 1,525. So these numbers, um, it, 
doesn't matter if there's a little more or a little less in the jail population that would reflect more runs? To the chair, to the councilwoman, uh, yes, it's very consistent uh, for that space. Whether it, now, if you added another five or six hundred, it would probably be a significant impact. Okay, but in that ballpark, it's fairly so consistent. So that's consistent. Does it matter? Like it spiked in April. Is there anything going on, um, or just like is it one person, one going several times? Is there any any understanding of why the spikes or what's going on? Because March was low. Or um, through, through the uh, chair to the councilwoman, a couple of points on that. My staff and I have uh, really, they have really dug into this. I can tell you a couple of things. One, uh, there is no exact pattern. I was under the suspicion that there was a pattern on like Friday, Saturday runs, and they have dug into this with a fine tooth comb, and that's not the case. There are times on a Tuesday when we have a lot of runs, uh, number one. Number two, uh, an inmate who goes out more than once is something that, uh, that'll be another category we track. It's important to know, but by the same token, if they're showing that kind of a medical need, then it's really important that we work on release. Now, obviously, aggravated murder, you're not going to be released, but, you know, so that, that will be something to, um, uh, to work on. But these numbers, we I absolutely expected a pattern. Uh, the one pattern that uh, Special Assistant Rebecca did detect, the first 10 days of the month, for whatever reason, tends to be a spike, and the reason for the spike is chest pain. Don't know what correlation there is, and there's a hundred different uh, things we come up with, but there is that is the only trend. We have looked at this because we know that part of sound management is to identify where those spikes are and address those through staffing, through discussion with the medical staff, et cetera, all over the place and fairly consistent throughout the week and throughout the month. I would say that March, um, there's not much of a, I'm going to say a need to get out, but it was cold out, it was winter time. Yeah, let's just stay here and, uh, you know, uh, I, I can only imagine that there's not that much cold, fresh air out there. So. On that point, uh, to the chair, to the sheriff, on, on those that are repeated, the, the 10 at the beginning of the month, are the have you looked at if the staffing is the same, if, the, if it's the same uh, prisoners that are making those complaints? Have you drilled down? Even, even further into that? Through the chair, through the councilwoman, that is one thing I have not, is whether it's the, re the repeat individual. But I don't think, uh, because it extends fairly consistent every month, and the average stay, there are some people here for a year, some are here for four days. The average stay in our facility is 34 days. So it's unlikely that the individual that's here on January 8th will be here on April 5th. Unlikely. So uh, I doubt, but that is a good one to look into, because there are some people who probably would be a uh, regular flyer, as we say. Okay. Um, so I just want to bring your attention to that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, comparison of overtime through operations, and you can see here, I'm not going to read all the numbers, but just so you know, uh, strong correlation here with uh, previous years, and we see any, there's a slight decrease in operations, slight increase in LE, and the jail is very, very slight increase. Uh, protective services, uh, again, uh, contracts kind of drive some of that. And as we know, the uh, FTEs are here and, and decided we'll get to that on the last slide here in a minute. But that's kind of where we are, a snapshot of the department, what the relative overtime is uh, for the uh, respective divisions. Uh, when we say operations, we're talking about uh, all things like uh, human resources, fiscal, all of the things that are kind of like the heart of the operation. Law enforcement, let's just think of uh, uniforms and badges. Uh, jail, we talk about the correction facility. And protective services are the officers that we know protect all of our buildings that you see on a regular basis uh, who are doing a terrific job there. But then that's who's uh, uh, en encompassed there. And this is through pay period 13, just so we're aware. To the chair, to the sheriff. Um, in terms of the overtime uh, comparison hours, which department covers our council meetings? Is that the sheriff's? Council meetings are covered by the uh, law enforcement, which would be the deputy sheriffs who, uh, um, in, in concert with the protective services. But uh, we have a uh, increase in the law enforcement component, as you know, uniform deputies and plainclothes deputies when there's potential, um, you know, a need for them at, at our council's hearings. That 
plays a role in the increase <clears throat> of um, the department actually um, securing our council meetings. Yes. Uh, next slide. And before I go to the next slide, I did want to mention one thing. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. So, uh, I checked about a couple of other large counties in the state, and, and uh, the, the overtime here, which is running about 20 million a year, it, it's like. Uh, it's like at least four or five times what anybody else has. And I'm wondering if you could provide any insight as to why our overtime costs are so high and, and what could be done to bring it down. Uh, thank, thank you, sir. Uh, through the chair to the councilman. A couple of things there. When we talk about overtime, clearly um, most of the situations are staffing shortages. Whether the staffing shortage is driven by assignment whether uh, we, we were able to hire enough people or not, which the answer is yes, we are, uh, or whether the staffing shortage is, call, is caused by people don't come to work because they're sick, it's a snowstorm, it's a, the Super Bowl, whatever it might be, those, those two things. Uh, we are in a situation where we're scoping the entire department to, and people use the term right size, to right size the operations. That discussion I've had uh, certainly here at council, I've had with the executives team, on making sure that uh, we have the right amount of people for the functions. And additionally to that, how much, I use this term, how much mileage can we get out of uh, different units to, to do some cross-training, do some other work. But the bottom line is that um, past 35 years, the Sheriff's Department has absorbed additional duties and responsibilities and has never accounted for that staffing. Other agencies may have accounted for those staffings as we go forward. Uh, I'll just bring your attention to one that we've talked about before, which is pretty glaring, the electronic monitoring unit. Electronic monitoring unit, as we spoke earlier, uh, we know what function they do. Obviously, they keep people safe, but it allows us to keep the population down and make sure that we're accountable. If we look at the numbers in other cities, in Ohio, look at Cincinnati and Columbus, by the amount of people who are on electronic monitoring, we would have an extra 40 to 60 deputies. If we look at those numbers, that's there, and that there are some people who say, hey, you should look at this, and we look and go, oh, wow, yeah, that's true. Um, not suggesting we put 60 more in there, but that is one area where we've talked about before, and as, uh, uh, an increase would be beneficial because the risk is, 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 is there. So to reduce that risk would be one example. Electronic monitoring, I'm gonna just use the term, probably 15 years it's been around, and when it was taken, just like everything else at the Sheriff's Department, the answer was yes. And they took it on and they made it work on a shoestring. And that's kind of kind of where it is. So that's an example, sir, as to what we could do. Uh, and there are some areas that additional staffing would cause a bump, obviously a budget, budgetary bump, but it would save, have a significant savings in overtime. In the correctional facility, there's uh, staffing is, is fairly adequate. Uh, the issue there that remains that we're continuing to improve on and drive down is the call off. It is individuals who call off or don't report to work for various reasons, hundred different, and this is a, I could this could be a whole council hearing for us on that. A uh, variety of reasons we're addressing those and we're we're making progress, but it is a a culture that uh, became ingrained there over the years. And even though the executive and council agreed to increase the numbers and support those the budgetary expenditure for the correctional facility, the culture kind of chipped away at that because you had these call-offs. So I, I reported in my last uh, presentation here in April that we're certainly uh, making some movement on separations, and that's something that we've done. And I'm very confident as we make additional separations and we onboard new people that that will continue to reduce. So that is getting better. So that is one area where because we staffed it properly, it's going to be working better. Yes, sir. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the sheriff, uh, there's something like 6 to $7 million per year in overtime that, that's uh, uh, embedded into the collective bargaining agreements 
for, for the co correction officers, I believe. And uh, my question is whether that's operationally necessary or do we have any intention to try to, to uh, negotiate a contract revision that would make that no longer necessary? Through the, through the chair, through the councilman, uh, currently it is operationally necessary. I do think as culture changes, and let's just use the example, everybody comes to work, that number will be significantly reduced. And at that point, we could absolutely discuss having a modification to it, sir. And I think that would that would be good management. Okay, thank you. To the chair, and the sheriff has um, lateral entry. Has that helped you, hurt you, or had no effect at all on Manpower? Uh, through the chair to the councilman, uh, always a help, sir. Always good to uh, have good people come over from different agencies with various experiences behind them, and that has absolutely helped, sir. It's been a, a very positive tool for us. So it's been easier to get get new people that way? Through the chair to the councilman, yes, sir. All right, thanks. A couple questions through the chair to the sheriff. The absorption of other duties that you stated, it, are is these uh, departments that um, you're absorbing, and I know one, for example, would be DCFS. Are, are those departments paying for that, those costs? Through the chair, to the councilwoman, uh, specifically DCFS, yes, that is something that we uh, recently had a discussion with the director and the executive's team, and uh, that is a, a funded expenditure where there's reimbursement for that cost. Uh, that reimbursement is fairly recent, within the last month, uh, so for the probably three, four years, it wasn't there. So that's an impact there. But it is going forward, that is a uh, expenditure that's covered. I would suggest do that with the other departments as well. And my second question would be on the incentives. Um, do you provide any incentives for perfect attendance for? Uh, uh, through the chair, through the councilwoman, that's something we're looking at. Uh, not only attendance, uh, also use of sick time, and probably more, most importantly, uh, re uh, recruitment incentive. If an individual, if a member of the sheriff's department makes a recommendation, this is what I'd like to propose, uh, makes a recommendation of an individual and they get hired, they get X amount of dollars. When the individual completes their their interest, their um, onboarding training, they get X. At the completion of one year of service, the recommending employee would get an another part of their incentive pay because that makes sure that we don't just have people coming in the door for 30 days. That shows an employee who's going to be here for a while. And whatever we come in amount to, that's something that's practiced elsewhere, and I think it's a good practice. So that's something that you'll be seeing percolating up here as time goes on. Okay, but Sheriff, that's just for the recruitment. Correct. What about incentive for the other employees for perfect attendance to kind of strive toward them not taking off? Uh, th through the chair of the councilwoman, that is an absolute uh, no another one that we've considered. Uh, can we tie that to like a yearly uh, bonus or incentive? Uh, again, not just the attendance, but the fact uh, sick time. As we know, there's a whole whole line of thinking and discussion here on sick time usage as far part of PERS and we're, what do you do at the end of the road when you retire, et cetera. But if you're not using it uh, and you're coming to work every day, which positively impacts the operation, there should be some benefit for that. So not that we want people who are ill to come to work and spread it. However, if they don't abuse it, that should be rewarded. And that's something you'll see that percolating also. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Final slide, just give you the staffing summary uh, snapshot here. I want you to see kind of where we are uh, numbers-wise, uh, vacancies approved, and certainly working uh, moving forward here. Uh, I, I can tell you that... Um, Recruitment team has been working uh, very, very uh, diligently on making sure that we're recruiting in uh, right spaces, getting the right people here, and that certainly contributes. I know that they have really honed their skills and, and sharpened uh, their lens as far as who they're looking for, uh, individuals that are more suitable for this position. And probably the biggest thing is, I think I mentioned this in April also, if we have employees who come and join us for a month and they report to work, and they go, you know what, this isn't for me. We respect that, and that's important, but it's also, uh, it, it could be a gap on our side that we need to address. What did we not clarify? What did we not inform these individuals 
hey, you need to be aware of this because it's here's, here's reality so they can kind of dial that back earlier on in, in, in the process. Now we have an employee who's been down the road for a month or six weeks. Now they're walking out the door, not coming back from lunch. That's not good for anyone. So that's something else that we're looking at is ensuring that we uh, let them know what the expectations are, what the conditions are, and, and, and give them the appropriate support. Using job coaches is an incredible tool. We have a number of new supervisors and, 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 and pressing up on them the importance of speaking with these younger employees and making sure we support them, especially early on, which is when the biggest culture shock is. Uh, li little things like looking at changing the shirts. New uh, employees in the correctional facility, uh, brand new employees wear a white shirt. And that's something that stands out. It's the way it's always been. Not, not the greatest practice, uh, partially because the, the shirts are all different shades uh, of the color. <laughs> so that's another thing. But um, it's important that we give them a, a, a shirt or a color or uniform that, that shows inclusion. They feel part of the team a little more. And then the other part is everyone knows they're the new employee. You could put them in an SRT outfit, and you know that's a new employee. But it's important at least they look the part a little bit different. So that's something else we're working on. Uh, we had a program where we're going to, uh, well, retooling that a little bit, but that's something we're working on because that's important. People walk in the door, that's one less thing you have to worry about, looking different than everybody else. So. And that is going to conclude my prepared update. Any questions from council for me? Uh, did you have something for uh, a question from Ms. Conwell from the last meeting? Any update from last time? Yeah, first, uh, the sheriff is um, I was going He's to done. Come on. on. <coughs> we forgot to give you those. Um, so uh, through the chair to Council and Conwell, you had asked us to look... Yes. Okay. All right. Let me back up for one second. Um, one of the things that, and this, I take blame for this when we put these slides together for the sheriff, I neglected to put on the medical transport slide, the outpatient runs. So far this year, there's been 382 outpatient runs. Outpatient runs is not an emergency. It's not a detail. That's a scheduled run like dialysis or if somebody has an appointment to get stitches taken out or something like that. But it's an outpatient run, a scheduled, a scheduled appointment. And so far this year, we've had 382 because I know our medical transports costs this year have exceeded over a million dollars, the cost of just the medical transports. So again, I take the blame for that. I overlooked it on the slide. So I just wanted to clarify that, the first thing. Um, This, no, no, no. no. I'm gonna, so um, the, uh, Councilman Conwell had asked us at the last public safety meeting about the HHS indigent fees. We did meet with uh, David Merriman and Walter Parfiowicz just to discuss it. Um, it was a quick meeting, but basically we explained to them what you were asking, and they both made it clear that there is, there's no levy indigent fees that can be used for an incarcerated inmate. So I, I just wanted, we just wanted to let you know that we did address it. Um, we did ask, you know, on your behalf. And then uh, 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 I, I think David had said he might reach out to Brendan Doyle about it. But yes, there, there are no funds through HHS that can be used for the jail inmates. That's, I can't speak too much about it because I don't know too much about it. But I, I, do, I do want you to know that we did address it. They're on Medicaid. Is, is there any action there? No, if, if on Medicaid, if, if the inmates on Medicaid, well, if they're in our, if they're in our jail and then, and, and correct, it's um, there, we pay for it. We pay Medicaid rates, but we pay for it. Now say they go and get admitted. Once they're admitted over 24 hours, then Medicaid picks it up outside, but once they come back to us, then there any medical cost is ours again. I'll find out why. Mm -hmm. Anything I, I, I had a question on the 382. So um, the outpatient runs, is there any way that you can see that you can lower that 
with better scheduling or whatever the case may be? I can ask that question to Metro Health. Again, I don't schedule those runs. I can find out if there's something we can do to maybe get that number down because it is pretty high. Um, but again, I, I'll, I'll put the question out to them and see what they come back with, if there's anything they can do. And I know at the last meeting you had said something about in the new jail getting our own dialysis and all that. That would probably all help in the new jail. Mm -hmm. But right now I'll see if there's anything they can do to get those runs down. Because they charge, they have a contract for the jail. We're giving them subsidy for the, um, for, for ind indigent uh, care. And then we're giving that additional uh, funding for all these outpatient runs and their stays in the hospital. and. Uh, Maybe the uh, subsidy can't be consolidated, but this other stuff needs to be consolidated and see how we get those numbers. Because you stay, you, you share with me if one thing, if they're on Medicaid, if they are not covered under Medicaid, then we're paying full, full price. If, if when when they go to another facility for care, we pay that other facility Medicaid rates. So they may bill us full price, then we code it, and we take, so say it's $1,000 for a service. We code it at the Medicaid rate, and maybe that is now $220. That's what we pay them. So we pay the Medicaid rates. If they get admitted to the hospital, then we don't pay it. Medicaid picks it up. We don't pay the Medicaid rates. Medicaid picks it up. Once they're admitted, I think it's 24 hours. Okay. And I think I had asked before someone uh, in terms of, medical services that we provide, what is the basic medical service that we must provide? Did anybody take a look at that? You mean uh, how I, the, the way I see it is correctional versus conventional. Um, that would be a, something else I think that Metro Health would have to address because we can't dictate how they some of the things we see, do I think there might be some conventional medicine going on? Probably. Um, but again, that would be a, a Metro Health question. Okay, thank you. We, we talk about that in the contract. One more thing I'd like to add. Uh, we talk about the dialysis, and that's something that I think I mentioned to Councilman. And I uh, did speak with Dr. Ish about this a few months ago and something that they were going to examine. And I do know it comes down to a matter of numbers. How many people are on dialysis today? How many runs? Um, just want to be clear that we always have at least a few, and those runs obviously are three times a week, X amount of hours. It, it does add up. We are not moving to the Central Services Campus tomorrow. We are looking at three years plus projection. So in that time, I think that if we ran the numbers on that, and it was possible w without it being obviously prohibitive, uh, it would probably be a good investment to do what we can to retool and have dialysis at the facility, if possible, structurally. I, I, I think uh, my discussions with him, the facility uh, does not cooperate with uh, our wants. Uh, the water pressure and availability of water is, is just not something that can be done. So we really are, I keep saying it, but the new facility is what we're looking at and doing that right and being able to provide these services there, which will, in the, in the end, bottom line, help us out. But uh, they did look at that. They did look at that. Oh, thank you, sir. I appreciate that. I just, uh, you know, would posit we know that uh, we have established dialysis uh, locations throughout the world, and sometimes some places that are much more sparse than uh, a, uh, what, 50-plus-year-old building. Uh, in the middle of deserts and rainforests and other places, uh, which kind of makes me wonder about the ability to bring in the right equipment and the one-time expenditure versus the consistent expenditure. But uh, understand that's medical professionals, and we will defer to the medical professionals' opinions on that. So, but which highlights the importance of working with the medical provider when building the new jail. Absolutely, sir. Hundred <laughs> yeah. percent. Thank you. Anything further? We're all good. Well, next time, uh, hopefully, we'll have the numbers from Metro. They should deliver those within the next two weeks on the runs, so we can uh, talk about that with a little bit more understanding of who's going where and why. Okay. Anything further? Miscellaneous? Thank you.
Thank you. Take your time.